Good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Ariana Longley from the Patient Safety Movement. Um, it's one minute until the top of the hour, so we'll just give it uh, one more minute and then we'll get started. Uh, everyone is on mute, um, just to be respectful. Uh, we had some issues last time with um, some noise in the background, so uh, I believe you have the opportunity to like raise your hand if you have a question, um, but there will be plenty of time at the end for questions. So um, we'll get started here in a moment. Okay, great. Well, good morning, everyone. Um, again, this is Ariana Longley from the Patient Safety Movement Foundation, um, and you are tuning in to our second um, quarterly webinar. This month, we are presenting an airway safety webinar, um, and we have a special guest, Dr. Art Kanowitz, and so we're really pleased to have him here. He's here with us in person in Irvine, so um, we, we really look forward to sharing um, some information about uh, airway safety with you. Um, just to look over the agenda for this, um, for this webinar, I'll start with a very brief 10-minute um, introduction about the Patient Safety Movement Foundation and our actionable patient safety solutions, which we call APPS. Um, and then we'll have 35 minutes for Dr. Kanowitz to spend time um, on his presentation about airway safety, and then we hope to have plenty, plenty of time left over to have uh, 15 minutes of questions and answers. Um, if you have any technical difficulties, um, just some housekeeping, um, please don't hesitate to email um, info at patientsafetymovement.org, um, or if you have Jordan Gamart's information, she uh, will be uh, available to help you. Okay, so um, as you probably know, our mission as the Patient Safety Movement Foundation is zero preventable patient deaths by the year 2020. And so we say zero by 2020. We know it's a very audacious mission, but we believe it's the only acceptable goal to have um, because one preventable patient death is one too many. The way that we operate as the foundation is we strive to foster new efforts and build on existing patient safety programs through commitments. Um, so we are a commitments-based organization, not membership-based. We really want to um, take a fresh approach to um, an old problem. We don't want to reinvent the wheel. We just want to amplify the work um, going out there. So I'm going to talk about five groups who can take action. These are the groups that we work with day to day. The first group is hospitals and healthcare organizations. And those organizations can make a commitment to improve patient safety and reducing preventable deaths um, and harm in their, in their hospitals. We publicly post their commitments on our website, so I encourage you, if you haven't checked that out, um, to, to look at what organizations are participating. We have over 3,500 to date. Committed partners are organizations like nonprofits, associations, and societies who sign a letter um, basically committing to action uh, so that they can help spread our mission across their membership, across groups that they're working with uh, in the same area. We definitely want to be complementary to other groups that are out there working on patient safety um, and, and not pro prohibitively block any work from um, occurring, only amplify it. The third group that we work with are healthcare technology companies. And we ask them to sign an open data pledge. What that means is those companies agree to share data in order to improve patient safety, uh, basically giving clinicians um, a, a picture of their patients earlier on. Um, hopefully, we can use that to develop predictive algorithms and hopefully one day use it in kind of big data analytics. The fourth group that we work with are patients and family members. Um, so we believe it's important to, whoops, uh-oh. Um, Siri Hernandez Gisul, I'm, uh, I'm very sorry, but thank you so much. Uh, accidentally switched over to him. Um, so we believe that it's extremely important to keep um, the, the patient at the center. We ask uh, family members to share stories, individuals to share stories about their experiences in the hospital. We also share resources on our website that they can utilize. And last but not least, the fifth group that we work with are also policymakers. Um, in addition to the 501c3 nonprofit that we run, we also run a 501c4, which helps us promote patient safety legislation. 
So these are the 13 actionable patient safety solutions. These are the challenges that we've identified since 2013 to focus on as primary issues that hospitals are facing um, that have uh, solutions that can be implemented today. Um, so today, uh, we're going to be focusing on airway safety. Um, if anyone's interested in looking at any of the other actionable patient safety solutions, they're available for download at patientsafetymovement.org. We also have uh, the capability to download the executive summaries in Spanish and in German um, to help uh, reach uh, additional um, people across the world. And in order for us to reach our goal of zero, um, you might wonder how we plan on doing that and how we track it. Um, we ask for hospitals that are making commitments to share how many lives they have saved by implementing uh, processes and, and uh, initiatives in patient safety. This is our um, historical uh, lives saved reports. Um, so we announce those every year at our annual summit. This last year in 2017, we announced that 69,500 19 lives have been saved um, through the work of the, the health, hospitals and healthcare organizations that are involved, um, and that was just in 2016. So this year we have a goal um, of achieving 150,000 total lives saved, and because we're doing work now both um, in the U.S. and internationally across 44 countries, we split that, so we hope to achieve 75,000 lives saved in the U.S. and 75,000 internationally. Um, so that was just a brief background about the patient safety movement. I wanted to ensure that everyone had a good background um, about us first. And I would now love to introduce Dr. Art Kanowitz. Um, he's an emergency physician with special interests in emergency medical services and airway safety. During his clinical years as an emergency department physician and later serving as the EMS medical director for numerous emergency service agencies, he became aware of unplanned extubation, the common and costly safety event that occurs during airway management. Determined to find a better solution for prevention, Dr. Kanowitz spent several years researching the problem before founding Secure Assign Medical in 2011 to develop and commercialize his patent and patented airway stabilization system. He served as Chief Executive Officer and Chief Medical Officer for Secure Assign Medical until recently when he transitioned uh, leadership of the company to a new CEO and adopted the role of founder, chairman, and CMO. Dr. Kanowitz also recently retired from his gubernatorial appointed position as a state emergency medical and trauma services medical director for Colorado's Department of Public Health and Environment, where he served from April 2008 until March 2017. Dr. Kanowitz has been actively involved in leading emergency services in Colorado for over 35 years. He was the president of the Colorado chapter of the American College of Emergency Physicians, served on numerous regional, state, and national committees and councils, and is diversely published in the medical liter literature. So with that, I'd love to pass it over to Dr. Kanowitz. Mariana, thank you very much. It's uh, my honor and privilege to be able to uh, present about airway safety, certainly a topic that um, I have become very passionate about um, over the last uh, 15 years. So author Simon Sinek emphasizes the importance of starting with why. Uh, and so I adopted that philosophy a number of years ago. And so we will start now with why is airway safety so important? Why do we do what we do? This is Drew Hughes. Drew was a 13-year-old, very happy a teenage boy living in uh, North Carolina in Emerald Isle. And um, one summer, he was skateboarding with a bunch of friends, which they did frequently, and he fell and hit his head. Um, Drew was transported to the local hospital where he was evaluated. At the time in the hospital, he was doing um, very well, actually. He was working with the uh, nurses and... Um, um, they did an evaluation to see how he was doing. They did a CAT scan and found that he had a basilar skull fracture. Um, because of that, they felt that they should be safe um, and felt like it was important to transfer him to the Level 1 Trauma Center, which was in um, Gainesville, about uh, two and a half hours away. 
So because the weather was poor, uh, they could not fly him. They made the decision to go ahead and transport him by ground ambulance. Um, and again, to be safe, they decided that they would um, intubate him so that during this long transport through rural areas, he wouldn't run into any problems. So they started the transport, um, and in route to the level one trauma center, um, Drew underwent an unplanned extubation. His life-sustaining breathing tube was accidentally pulled. Um, the crew, which involved a um, EMT, a paramedic, a respiratory therapist, and a nurse, um, all tried to reintubate him. Um, unfortunately, they intubated his esophagus, and then on top of that, they failed to recognize that the tube was not in his trachea, that it was in his esophagus. Drew died not from his head in, not from his head injury. Drew died from the perfect storm of airway safety events. And Drew is why Drew died a preventable death. Drew, like the 12,000 other patients every year who die a preventable death from unplanned extubation, is why we do what we do. Airway management is a medical procedure that is supposed to be life-sustaining, yet it's associated with lots of safety events. Um, and those safety events are associated with lots of complications, some of them very severe, leading to things like severe brain injury and even death. And the safety events include a whole spectrum of events, everything from failure to get the tube in, delay in getting the tube in, once the tube is in, the tube moving to a malpositioned place causing all sorts of problems, um, pressure injuries, and then the tube coming out not supposed to. Today we're going to, during this webinar, we're going to really concentrate on what I believe is the mother of safety events of airway management, and that is unplanned extubation. So unplanned extubation is the unintentional removal of one's life-sustaining uh, breathing tube. It is both a very common and a very costly safety event. Unplanned extubation occurs over 70,000 times a year in the United States ICU alone, leading to 12,000 preventable deaths and more than $4 billion in unnecessary healthcare costs. So let me give you some background to where we come up with these numbers. This is a study that was published in 2012 in Anesthesia and Analgesia uh, by the Society of Christians care anesthesiologists. It's a review of the worldwide literature. It involves more than 50 studies and more than 50,000 patients. And the average unplanned extubation rate across all 50 studies is 7.3%. Now, the, the, this um, review article looks at studies that go back um, almost as much as 50 years. So you might say, well, that's really old data. Um, although if you look at just the last five years of the study, um, the unplanned extubation rate was still 6.4%. So despite all the technology and, and processes that have been put into effect, we're still at a very poor rate of 6.4%, with the range being um, anywhere from 2 to almost uh, 20%. Although I'm aware of a study that actually was not included in this review, um, it was actually a neonatal study um, done in the neonatal intensive care, and their rate of unplanned extubation was 46%. So if you take that 7.3% unplanned extubation rate and apply it across the more than 1 million mechanically ventilated ICU patients in the United States each year, that's how we come up with the 73,000 incidences of unplanned extubation yearly. Now, more recent data would suggest that the number of mechanically ventilated patients is actually closer to one and a half million, and that would put the incidence of unplanned extubation um, over 100,000. So besides being common, unplanned extubation is very costly. It's costly in patient complications. 
the complications from unplanned extubation, again, being a wide spectrum of complications, things like pneumonia, vocal cord paralysis, severe brain injury, and death. The study that was done by De La Sense shows that when you compare mechanically ventilated patients with an uncomplicated course compared to those who have undergone an unplanned extubation, those patients who undergo an unplanned extubation spend uh, more than double the amount of time, almost triple the amount of time on the ventilator and spend about two and a half um, times the amount of time in the ICU. So that is uh, an increase, significant increase length of stay. Um, the incidence of pneumonia is actually double as well. It's also costly as far as the cost of each hospital stay. So if you look at the cost of an average ICU stay of a ventilated patient who does not undergo an unplanned extubation, the cost is $59,000. For the average cost for uh, an ICU stay in a ventilated patient who undergoes an unplanned extubation, $116,000. So an unplanned extubation essentially doubles the cost of a hospital stay. If you translate that across all of the unplanned extubations that occur in the United States each year, that's how we get the over $4 billion in healthcare um, costs. And actually, if we use the 100,000 incidents, that would put this at over $5 billion. Now, another way of looking at, that, at this is for the average hospital, if you have a 1% change in your unplanned extubation rate, um, your cost will change by $2.5 million. So if you can improve it by 1%, you can save $2.5 million. If, you, if your rate increases by 1%, it will cost the hospital $2.5 million. The cost is also um, very much applicable to mortality. There are uh, over 12,000 deaths every year in the United States. Um, so if you look at unplanned extubations, there are categories that occur. Um, approximately 50% of unplanned extubations um, are almost ready to be extubated anyway. Um, and those patients do not if they undergo an unplanned extubation, they do not need to be reintubated. The mortality rate in that group is 3%. Um, however, the other 50% of unplanned extubations, those that do require reintubation, the mortality rate in that group is 35%. Um, and that's how we get to the total unplanned extubation rate. So any all comers of unplanned extubation, their overall mortality rate is 19%, thus the 12,000 deaths a year. So unplanned extubation is clearly common and it's clearly very costly. So what is the cause of unplanned extubation? Well, this is not crazy physics, this is not, a, or this is not about nanoparticles, this is a very simple under, thing to understand. This is simple physics. So an unplanned extubation occurs when the force that is applied to remove the device um, exceeds the force that you are applying to restrain the device. Vice versa, if you can apply more force to hold the device in place, you're less likely to have the um, device removed. So what is the current management? Well, there is the old standby adhesive tape. Adhesive tape has been the gold standard of, of airway management for as long as I've been in practice, which is over 45 years. Um, and currently today, it still is about 80% of the methods used to restrain a tube. The other 20% are essentially broken up between a whole slew of commercial devices. The Hollister Anchorfast is the most commonly used device in hospitals today, and the Lairdahl Thomas tube holder is the most common device used in uh, pre-hospital. Despite a, a number of commercial devices being out there, the rate of unplanned extubation remains unacceptable. 
So how do we get to zero preventable deaths from unplanned extubation? I think of um, four tacks that can be used to helping us get to zero preventable deaths. Number one is universal tracking. We have to better track unplanned extubation. Number two is application of actionable patient safety solutions. Number three is identifying and sharing best practices. And number four is developing disruptive technology, technology that can prevent the tube from moving once it's in place. It's commonly said that if you can't measure it, you can't improve it. So the unplanned extubation rate that we talk about, 7.3%, I believe is likely just the tip of the iceberg. And why is that? Well, most hospitals don't track unplanned extubation, and those that do track it and that publish it are probably the better um, institutions at improving it. So I think the 7.3% is probably the tip of the iceberg. So why do hospitals not track unplanned extubation? And I can tell you, traveling around the United States a lot, I always ask the question, what's the unplanned extubation rate in your hospital? And I always get the blank stare in the headlights look, and I don't know what it is. Um, well, the reason many hospitals do not track it is because it's not easily trackable unless you have a specific data set to track it. And most EMRs today do not have specific data sets for tracking unplanned extubation. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services is certainly doing significant strides at helping improve patient safety, and they're doing that through their quality metrics and then driving um, procedures to improve um, the quality of care. And they certainly now have added unplanned extubation as one of their priorities at looking at making that a quality metric and helping to improve patient safety surrounding airway management. Obviously, the Patient Safety Movement Foundation is also doing lots of things to help improve airway safety. Um, number one, through their Airway Safety Task Force. Um, and the Airway Safety Task Force has um, developed this uh, data brochure, and the data brochure can be downloaded through the Patient Safety Movement uh, website, and the instructions um, are included um, on this slide. This is um, the data set that is included in the brochure, and it helps you understand what data points do you need to appropriately track unplanned extubation. So first you need when was the patient intubated, both the date and time, and when they were extubated, both the date and time. That gives you um, the amount of time that the patient was intubated, um, and the reason for that is the longer you're intubated, the higher your risk of an unplanned extubation. Um, next, you want to look at was the intubation planned or unplanned? Um, unplanned being there was not an order and an intention written to uh, pull the tube out. It either occurred because the patient pulled it out or due to an accident that pulled the tube out. Um, and then you want, once you determine it's an unplanned extubation, you want to know was the patient reintubated? Was a reintubation required? Um, and obviously, as I previously discussed, that significantly changes your um, risk of mortality. And then you want to track what are the complications that were found in that patient associated with the unplanned extubation. So the metric that is used to look at unplanned extubation is the rate of unplanned extubation in patients undergoing mechanical ventilation via endotracheal intubation. So there's two ways that we look at these metrics. One is the standard percentage. What is the number of unplanned extubation per 100 patients? Um, that gives you a, a percentage number. Um, and for instance, 6.4% is the average um, based on um, the last five years of the literature with the, um, you'll normally see that there's a rate. So um, if you're in the two to 20%, you're within 
the published studies rate, um, and obviously 6.4 being the average. However, the other way of looking at the metric of unplanned extubation is a risk-adjusted measurement, um, and that um, risk adjustment is for the amount of time the patient is intubated. So to do that, you take the number of intubations per 100 ventilation days, so it takes into consideration the amount of time each patient was intubated um, that undergoes an unplanned extubation, and then that gives you your total ventilation days. That normal, that number, um, based on the published literature, averages 0.6 with a range of 0.1 to 3.6. So that gives you a risk-adjusted metric for unplanned extubation. So let's talk about the actionable patient safety solutions. How are we going to attack improving unplanned extubation? So on, if you download um, app number eight, um, you will get the uh, app for airway safety, and it's broken up into a couple sections. The first section is the executive summary checklist, and I will break down this slide to um, a little uh, bit more of a summary. So the executive checklist really looks at um, six different points. It looks at, number one, assembling a core multidisciplinary team. It's important to have a lot of disciplines involved in organizing this and making sure it's done and done correctly. So you need clinicians, you need risk management personnel, and you really need C-level execs to help um, say that this is important and it will be done and we will work at improving it. So once you have the team, then you need to establish what is the need for improvement. If you have zero unplanned extubations and zero deaths from unplanned extubation, then there's probably no need to do anything. Um, I've not seen that to be the case anywhere. Um, I think we all have room for improvement. So to do that, we need to track what is your individual hospital's rate, what is our overall system of um, unplanned extubations. So that requires tracking the data and then looking at the data to improve care. Next, you want to um, make sure to implement um, policies and procedures um, and standardize best practices. Um, you want to develop a comprehensive airway toolkit, which I'll talk a little bit more about here shortly, um, and then use your quality management um, cycle to make sure that you are improving care. So collect the data, review the data, um, identify the root causes, find solutions, educate, implement those solutions, and then verify that what you're doing is in fact making a difference. The next part of the app goes through a series of um, uh, very much specific specific things on these five items. So um, the first thing is the performance gap, and that really looks at um, threats and vulnerabilities. And I look at the threats and vulnerabilities, or actually the Patient Safety Task Force looked at the um, performance gap, the threats and vulnerabilities, as really in three main areas, delayed intubations, failed intubations, and lost intubations, which are the unplanned um, extubations. Um, then the um, app goes through very specific recommendations for a leadership plan, a practice plan, a technology plan, and then metrics. And you can get in, um, look at those and get very specific details on how to implement those plans in your hospital. And then lastly, there's a excellent appendix at the end of the app, um, which really looks at airway essential components. Um, and these airway essential components are in a table that looks at what are the solutions, um, what are the level of recommendations, are, are these mandatory things, or are they recommended? Um, and then there are um, things that support why we came up with those decisions. And so we look at a failed airway protocol, a series of airway equipment, um, critical practices in clinical care, and then team training. So the actionable patient safety solution, number eight, airway safety, is an excellent method for helping you um, implement 
processes and procedures to help you improve unplanned extubation. So what will it take to get to zero preventable deaths? Again, I said there are four items that I look at. Tracking, application of the apps, sharing back best practices, and new disruptive technology. So the technologies that we've seen that are out there um, were looked at in this study that was done at the University of Colorado um, Division of Biomedical Engineering. And they compared adhesive tape, which again is 80% of um, stabilization of devices in the United States today. Uh, they looked at the twill tie, um, and they looked at the two most common commercial devices, um, the Thomas Tube Holder and the Hollister Anchor Fast. They also compared those to a device that's undergoing research and development that is not currently on the market. And essentially, they looked at pulling forces with, these, with the tubes being held by these devices, pulling forces in 13 different directions. Um, if you're a patient and you um, are starting to get conscious and you grab at your tube, you're likely to pull, let's say, if you look at the chart at the bottom left here, in direction number four. You're going to grab the tube and pull away from your mouth. Um, that will pull in direction four. However, if you're being put from a gurney into the CT gantry and your ventilator tubing catches on the edge of the gantry, um, it may pull in direction 13 or direction 10. So uh, when they did the study, they felt it was important to look at all the potential directions um, that potentially could be applied to remove the tube. Um, and the chart there shows that um, there are lots of different forces and, and, and what the restraint forces are. Um, and to just make that chart a little simpler to understand, um, so looking at um, each force, there's a minimum force and a maximum force. There's also an average force. Um, the authors felt that really looking at the um, minimum force was most important because that was your most vulnerable force or position for an unplanned extubation. And you can see at the, the current devices that are being used today to restrain tubes, the um, most vulnerable direction and force is about um, 15 to 20 pounds. And the new device is about two and a half times that amount. Um, and so I think this study suggests that we can get better at restraining against more force. We need to continue to do research and development and develop a device that can restrain the tube from coming out regardless of the amount of force that is applied to remove the tube. So that takes us to my ask. And I'm going to request that everybody that is on this webinar today do a few things. Number one, I'm going to ask you to go to your individual hospitals and ask the question, what is our rate of unplanned extubation? If you're given the typical answer, we don't track it, we don't know, then I would ask the question, why? And what do we need to do to begin tracking it? I would also ask the question, what is your hospital's electronic medical record? And do they have a specific data field for tracking unplanned extubation? If they do not, I would request that you contact your EMR and ask them to begin including the data fields for unplanned extubation so that we can do a better job at tracking unplanned extubation. If you are told your rate is 2% or 7% or 12%, I think you then need to look at implementing the actionable patient safety solutions because if your rate is more than zero and there are any deaths from unplanned extubation, you need to do what you can to get that death rate to zero. So implement the actionable patient safety solution number eight, airway safety, in your institution and help us improve unplanned extubation and help us get to zero preventable deaths. 
Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Kanowitz, for a, a very thorough presentation. I, I love the focus on all the costs and both financial um, and, you know, having to deal with um, human lives. So we really appreciate um, you coming the whole way to California to share with us and everyone who's on the line. Um, I'm going to unmute everyone. So, um, the device is currently undergoing um, significant research and development. Um, it's a manufacturer um, and is um, being reviewed by the FDA. Um, we're looking at clearance probably mid next year. Sorry, I had to mute. 
Okay. And so, um, great. Did that answer your question? Yes. Thank you. Welcome. Um, we'll have time for more questions if there's any others out there. When you ask him to, are they acceptable to it usually, or are they? Yeah, I, I think there's a combination. I think um, I think if hospitals are really unaware of how big a problem it is, it's kind of we've got the blindfolds on, and so we don't really wear them. <laughs> when, when I talk to hospitals, other than them, I don't. Well, certainly the House of Medicine has some hesitancy mm -hmm. to tracking things that lead to complications and lead to death. However, um, I think that um, is changing in healthcare completely. I think we're really getting to the point where we understand we have to track them and we have to improve them. And so I think hospitals would be definitely willing to do that. I think part of the problem is the hospitals don't really have good control over the EMRs. And so I think the hospitals need to encourage the EMR companies mm -hmm. to get on board because they're the ones, and, it's, and this is an easy change. This is you know five or six data points. Um, adding that to the EMR is not a difficult process. Um, and so I think um, that's something that if the EMRs had better tracking um, and, and the hospitals understood how much money they were um, expending unnecessarily because of these uncom because of these complications, that would be an impetus for them to improve. But I think most importantly, we have to keep in mind foremost, this is about patient deaths, and one patient death is too many. Mm -hmm. And so I think that really is the impetus for hospitals that we should do what we can to make it better. And this is not rocket science. This is not difficult. It's really a pretty easy procedure mm -hmm. if we just put it in front of us and take it on. Um, from my question, does unplanned excavation include unplanned In the um, literature that I reference, although certainly what you're referring to is a significant problem as well, um, and it's really the same kind of issue if, if the force to remove the tracheostomy tube is more than the force you're using it to hold it in place, it's going to come out. Um, replacing an endotracheal tube typically is more difficult than replacing a tracheostomy tube, especially if it's an older tracheostomy tube that, or tracheostomy hole that's really healed over. The big problem with decannulation of tracheostomy tubes um, and we just had a big case of this on the news in the last week or two, um, was a child that the tube came out um, and, and the child was sleeping, there was nobody around, they didn't hear the um, ventilator alarm when it went off and the child ended up dying. Um, so although it's fairly easy to put the tube back in with the tracheostomy tube, whereas endotracheal tubes can be much more difficult to put back in. It's still a significant problem, and, and thank you for, for bringing that up. Great. We have another question um, from the web, and it's from Katie uh, Makedis, and she's asking, when will CMS add unplanned extubation as a quality measure? Well, I personally have spoken with CMS numerous times, and I know they have made unplanned extubation a priority for this round with their um, uh, hospital engagement network. They're looking very closely at um, doing this and including it as a quality metric, um, and I think it will be soon. 
Now, obviously, remember this is a federal government agency, and and the wheels turn a little bit more slowly. They have to be looked at very things have to be looked at very critically, um, and we have to make sure that um, that they're they're doing it right, and 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 that takes time. So my guess is probably um, it could be a year, it could be a couple years, um, but I think um, they clearly understand that this needs to be a priority, that there are significant patient safety issues related to unplanned extubation, um, and that CMS can help us improve it, number one, by mandating um, data tracking of unplanned extubations, um, and, and then through their um, quality metric system, encouraging hospitals to get on board to put in place the improvements that are necessary, and we all improve it together. Okay, great. I've unmuted everyone again, so if anyone would ask a question, I'd um, love to hear them.